Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today I am over the moon excited to welcome our very special guest, multi-award winning platinum recording artist and concert performer extraordinaire, Matt Dusk. Matt, thank you so much for being here. This is a great day. This is a wonderful day. Thanks for having me. I hope you never get tired of being told not only that you have an incredibly great voice that was born to sing the great American songbook and jazz among other genres, but also that you actually transport your audience back to the era of the great pruners. You yeah. do know that, right? It's uh, it's something that I've loved my entire life. I remember as a young teenager um, kind of getting into the crooner catalog and I always felt like I kind of belong there just because I love the music. I love the melodies. I love the big band, the big orchestras. And so whenever I'm performing, I'm transported back to that time when I first heard it. And I have a funny feeling that people kind of feel a little bit nostalgic when they hear the music as well. Absolutely. Even people that weren't alive when these songs were first recorded. Yeah, that's including me. <laughs> <laughs> what I find truly amazing about you as an artist is that you have recorded many songs that were standards and signature songs of some of the most iconic male singers in modern history. And yet you find ways to make these songs unmistakably your own and you give them a contemporary sound and feel. How do you do that? You know, it's a it's a good question. I mean, the the history of music, if you go back about 70 years, back to the, you know, 19 early 1950s and even to the 1940s, it was really publisher and publishing driven by songwriters. So say Cole Porter or Irvin Berlin would come out with a song and then 50 people would cover it. And then throughout the careers of those individuals, they would have little chest nights, like say, for example, Fly Me to the Moon would be one with uh, Frank Sinatra or I've Got You Under My Skin as well. People know Ella Fitzgerald's rendition of that. So. If, for me, it's I, I grew up in this this genre of interpretation and kind of like opera, kind of like classical, even though the songs have been written and have done before, we don't have those original artists still around. So us as artists have to get lost in the music just like those artists did. And if you sing it enough times and you practice enough, it really does become your own or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> I think you pay tribute to the crooner style, but your songs are produced in a contemporary style. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate. I've been doing this now for, I mean, professionally for almost 25 years. And there, there are standards in my catalog. I mean, I've recorded over 250 songs. And then there's also songs where, you know, I, I was born in 1978. I did go to high school in the 1990s. I, I definitely am influenced by you know, the MP3s and CDs and streaming. So, you know, I, I definitely try to interpret stuff in a, in a modern way, but at the same time, I think there's also room to write your own stuff and to continue the catalog. But at the end of the day, great music never dies. And that's why we're here because we love those great songs. So true. Matt, yeah. there's so much about your musicianship to admire. You're not just a singer with a great voice. You actually studied music academically in a yeah. serious way. As a child, you attended the St. Michael's Choir School for 11 years. You studied music at York University. You attended master classes taught by Oscar Peterson, and you were awarded the Oscar Peterson Scholarship. My question <laughs> is, how do you think your formal music education has impacted on the choices you've made in your career? Oh man, I mean, education is everything. Um, you know, people don't get better at music without having stepping stones. I mean, you can't just sit down at a piano and play like Art Tatum. I mean, you have to sit down there. I mean, I don't know if anybody will ever play as good as him, but you know, everybody's got to start somewhere and slowly learn. I mean, I was indoctrinated into music quite at a young age, as you were saying, St. Michael's Choir School at the age of seven. Um, you know, I was singing an hour every day. So I was given some very good formal rudimentary training, which I believe even for popular today, you need that because unfortunately, if you don't get that formal training, we all develop bad habits. Um, but if you're aware of the formal training of how to do it, it just helps you avoid those issues. I mean, there's a reason why you see Tony Bennett still performing after 70 years, you know, he just unfortunately 
had to had to retire from the the music because of Alzheimer's. But at the same time, who does something for seventy years? Who does that? And you know, having spent numerous times with Tony Bennett, he was always the one that was just saying, "Hey, man, it's music. You're always learning. It never ends. It's a carrot and a stick." So that all comes from the training from when you're a wee kid to you know, hopefully. We all can live as long as Tony Bennett. We all can learn up to that age. Absolutely. Now, everybody knows that you became world famous very quickly in 2004 on the TV show, The Casino. Yeah. <laughs> and that wonderfully melancholy song, Two Shots of Happy, One mm. Shot of Sad, came from that show and from your first major label album. Would you ever do another TV show? Well, I'm doing a TV show with you right now. <laughs> yes. It's it's interesting. I mean, if you look at television again, but going back to the 50s when it was just in its infancy, there were very, very few networks, very few shows. And as we've kind of grown older and as technology has improved, we've also seen more mediums. Like we're here we are doing a Zoom conversation. Um, we have YouTube at our disposal, social media. Doing something in television, I think I think the visual is extremely important just because you get so much more about um, an artist on a visual side of things than just the music. Because in the music side of things, and I think yourself and most music listeners can agree to, we love the song, we love the performance, but who is the artist? Who is the artist? And more of the visual aspect of doing stuff like this allows people to a window into relating beyond beyond the beyond the music itself. Well, I like to think that if you had been around in the 50s and 60s, you likely would have had your own variety show like Dean Ooh. Martin. <laughs> and like you, you would have appeared on the Hollywood Palace and Ed Sullivan and all those variety shows. Does it bother you that there are no variety shows on TV today no. and that really the only music shows are the singing competition shows like American Idol and The Voice? You know, um, variety, you talk about variety shows. I'm a big lover of them just because it just gave people a little taste of different things when they didn't have access to so much information, you know? So if I look at say nowadays and I watch these, listen, I watch very, very little TV to be honest with you, but I, I watch highlight reels and I read the news feeds with these singing competitions or like, um, so, you know, you kind of got to look at it and say, these, these artists are, are put in these positions just for the TV show, but they're right. actually not succeeding as artists um, just because they're here today, gone tomorrow. Um, however, though, it is good experience for these artists at least to get in front of a camera and play in front of an audience because it's more than ever difficult to do that. So I, 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 I just hope music never dies, especially after this pandemic. It's uh, been a rough haul for a lot of people. Would you ever agree to be a judge on a TV singing competition show? That's a tough one because um, I'm not very negative. I'm not like Simon Cowell. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I see music as a form of communication. If you're good or you're bad, it doesn't matter as long as you can communicate the message. But you know so, technique. Yeah, I, I know my technique. I, I, I was trained um, through a lot of people who were very experienced, but I'm the first one to say I'm getting old, right? <laughs> it's like they're, these new kids, they probably have so many new, new things that I don't know about. So would I ever do a, be a judge in one of those shows? You know, I've never been asked. So I probably would say yes. <laughs> but I, I hope be you guy. would because I think technically <laughs> You have so much skill that we all see and hear that you could convey. Now, yeah. in, in, in 2006, you recorded your second album, Back in Town, in the legendary mm. Studio A at Capitol Records in Hollywood yeah. with a 58-piece orchestra. Nobody even does that anymore. It's Tell pretty us, rare. Yeah. It's so rare. Tell us what it felt like to be recording in that studio where everybody from Sinatra, Judy Garland, Tony Bennett, Dean mm -hmm. Martin, all the greats have made classic recordings there. I mean, it was it was it was it was quite a challenge to go down to L.A. and see this iconic building that looks like a stack of records. And, you know, when you're walking down the hall from the entrance of the building to Studio A, you're seeing pictures of Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra. 
um, Billie Holiday, you know, the, the, the gamut of artists that had, had performed there. And you're like, holy cow, this is, this is my opportunity. This is my opportunity to do what they love to do. So when I got into the studio and there's the full big band orchestra with, with the strings, I mean, I, I was in heaven. I mean, it, it, if the walls could talk, you know, so we actually took out uh, the, the, the U 47 microphone that, that Frank Sinatra actually used to perform to, and we recorded on it. It was kind of cool. Does the room have a vibe, a feel compared to other studios you've worked in? I mean, there's so many photographs that we've seen that studio in that when you look at it, you, you gotta be like, oh, well, that's where Billy May stood and that's where Frank Sinatra sang and the layout's kind of the, the same. So there is a, there is a kind of um, a heightened sense of performing well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you did it. You really did it. That's that's one of my favorite thank of all your albums. Oh, thank you. It was a fun record to make, that's for sure. Do you think it's harder for Canadians to break into the music scene than for Americans, even still today? I I, I don't know. Things are changing. Um, in the last two, two years, especially, specifically since the pandemic kind of came out, there's been a lot of a digitization of how music is streamed to the world. I mean, the major labels still are have their hold on the delivery stream. They still are the the gatekeepers. I mean, we're very fortunate in Canada that um, we do have our number of programs that assist artists in creating music. Uh, one of them is Factor. Another one of them in Ontario is called the uh, OMDC, and they give artists the opportunity to stretch their legs. This used to happen, for example, in the early years of the recording business. Someone would get signed to a record label for five albums, and at the end of five albums, if they weren't successful, they'd be dropped. Nowadays, if somebody gets signed to a major label, if they don't do well in one single, their careers are over. And you, you, you would you and I know this is this that sometimes things in life take a little more than just one, you know, we all can't win the lottery right off the bat. So getting back to the whole thing with uh, these, these programs that the government has been very helpful with, you know, there's a reason why you see artists like the weekend artists like Justin Bieber, Sean Mendez, um, Shania Twain, uh, Diana crawl, all of these artists are Canadian and they started because the government did, actually um, invest very smallly, but enough that would allow these ta talents to shine. And this is why the joke in the music industry is, man, Canucks are always at the top of it. <laughs> That's for sure. You've made it very clear many times that you're a Canadian artist who likes living in Canada. Do you think the time might come when you'll be lured to the United States for career purposes? You know, I, I lived in the States for about four years. Um, it was... I lived in Vegas from when I, I think it was 2004 to 2008. Fun, different, but I am completely biased when it comes to Canada. I mean, Canada is by far my favorite country in the world to live in. We're very, very fortunate. I know we can cry and complain as everybody does, but in comparison to the rest of the world, we really got it. We really got it good. And I love to say Canada is my home and it would be impossible for me to move. Now, I know it's obvious that Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Dean Martin were among your musical influences. And if anybody has not heard your Sinatra album, they need to because yeah. it's absolutely fantastic. It's a great record. Not because I'm on it, the musicians, they were just phenomenal. But I've also read that you're a big fan of Sarah Vaughan and Bob Fenton. Any other musical influences? Uh, you know, everyone asks me what I listen to on my time off. I'm usually listening to old jazz or, or modern electronic music, um, which sounds quite odd because they're so different. But again, I grew up in, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. I think that at the end of the day, as long as there's music in your life and you have it playing, it contributes something to your well-being. And oh yeah, why not toss on my record? <laughs> 
Tell us about your musical choices. You've paid tribute to Chet Baker in the My Funny Valentine album. You've yeah. done the Sinatra album, but you've also done songs by the Beatles. You did Please Please Me. Mm -hmm. And you've done Broadway on your live uh, from Las Vegas album. You did Luck Be a Lady. Yeah. You see, I did my homework. <laughs> How do you go about choosing songs to record? Well, I, so, so, so my thing is that I am a singer from a specific era. I mean, I, I, I carry a torch. I don't try to copy. Um, I don't try to think I'm better. I don't try to think I'm worse. I just think I'm part of a crew that loves this kind of music. Unfortunately, the people that I find great are gone. They're, they're either um, not touring anymore or they've passed away, whatever. So, you know, when I'm putting a show or a tour, the, the tour is the idea behind the album. So I try to focus on different parts of the history of the, the genre that I love so that when people come, come to my show, there doesn't have to be a lot of heavy thinking in terms of like, if I say, okay, My Funny Valentine, Chet Baker. Usually people who know that song, My Funny Valentine, it automatically puts them into a, into a, a mood. Right. Um, the whole thing with the Sinatra record, to be honest with you, wasn't really supposed to be an album I was going to re release. It was just songs that I had never recorded in my life, but I, but I've performed at my shows. And I said, Oh, well, we should just get together in the studio and, and record these songs. Um, what I noticed is that when we started to go on the road and tour, we'd sneak these numbers in like fly me to the moon. I've got turned to my skin. A lot of rare ones too, that some people won't necessarily know. But what I noticed is that there was this heightened awareness from the audience they they sit up they look they clap a little louder and the communication was pretty strong so that then continued on to the next record which was the the the, the sinatra record so again it's taking people when they come to see me know that they're going to be given a snapshot or a, a tribute to that era that's that's kind of where i'm thinking when i'm making records that's really interesting, actually. It's a, it's a unique way of deciding how to deliver material is that you actually think about the concerts. Always concert first. I mean, what's the point? I mean, you can do songwriting at the same time, but that's more of a, an artist's kind of way of putting mind to paper. But if it's coming into renditions or, or um, renditions of classic songs, we're thinking about the audience. We're thinking about what would they like to hear and what do, what do we want to get up to and snap to? <laughs> exactly. Now, in addition to your popularity here in North America, you are a huge star in Eastern Europe, especially yeah. Poland. You have numerous gold and platinum albums there. Your concerts are always sold out months in advance there. What's the connection with Poland? So my, my wife is Polish. And uh, I met her here in Canada. Um, and I think it was a couple things. I, I, I think number one, there was no one doing what I was really doing in Poland. Um, Michael Buble obviously is a fantastic artist, but is too busy to go to Poland. <laughs> so there was a spot for me. And there was a little bit of a good story of someone from our country being with a Canadian crooner, which is, you know, my wife and myself. And it kind of just resonated. The, the, the interesting th thing though, is that Poland's kind of like my second home just because my wife's family is there. Um, I go back there numerous times for work. Um, but it's very, very, very similar to Canada, same kind of weather, same amount of people. Um, they like the kind of music that you and I enjoy doing. So it's, I, I guess I'm lucky. I think you're a great ambassador for Canada. That's <laughs> for sure. I always tell them to come over and come get some of this great maple syrup. They love it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite Matt Dusk albums is your duet album, Quiet mm -hmm. Night. Yeah, that album was number one on the Canadian jazz charts for 16 weeks. But I'm fascinated that you made that album three different times with three different duet partners. Once for North America with Florence K, once for Poland, and the album is called Just the Two of Us with Margaret. Mm. 
and once for Japan with Karen Aoki, and you called the album Lost in Rio. What <laughs> gave you the idea to make three separate versions of the same album? Like, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I've been in the music business long enough that I can understand ways to get into markets. And the one thing about jazz is no matter where you are in the world, no matter what language that country speaks, there is a there is there is there is a, a nonverbal language of communicating through music. Absolutely. So as a as as a jazz performer growing up in bars, like when I was in my late teens, um, early 20s, you know, we never knew who would be on stage with us that night if some drunk you know, patron wanted to come up and sing That's Life, come on up. If some great uh, virtuoso trumpet player was in town, wanted to jam on a tune, come on up. So I found that the the way to get into different countries is to say, hey, I want to find an artist who I think would be amazing to work with and say, okay, what if we took this duet album? Because remember, the, the I'm paying for the 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 tracks and then that artist and me go into um the studio and just record new vocals and it just worked because i think at the end of the day jazz is about interpretation and about collaboration so it just was an easy way to come up with an idea as going okay well what is the easiest way for us to get into market i think it was incredibly ingenious yeah. it was a very smart move and it really shows your versatility and also your international appeal that's the music, though. I mean, that's where jazz is. I mean, jazz might not be the most popular music in the world, but there is a, a sandbox in every country to play in. Absolutely. But now I have to ask you, who are some of the singers that you haven't done a duet with that you would like to? Because I have to tell you, my favorite of all your duets is the one you did with Lorna Luft on yeah. the Live from Las Vegas album. Let there be Lorna. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um. You know, I mean, it's 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 the usual suspects that I've just been, you know, I like idols of. I mean, I mean, I remember some Harry Connick. You know, Michael Bublé and I have sang together, but not in a professional uh, a setting. Diana Krall, uh, Paul Anka. I mean, the truth is though, is it doesn't matter who I sing with. It really doesn't matter. To be honest with you, I'd rather not know the person because it becomes more about the music than about the the fear I have of, oh my God, I'm recording with, <laughs> you know, the anticipation. But you know what, there's, I'm hoping that I have another 40 years left to go in this this genre, and I'm hoping there'll be a lot more duets, maybe with you. Well, I, well, we're doing one now, but you're carrying the tune, baby. I got to tell you, um, I would love to see you do an album with uh, Lady Gaga. I think you'd be amazing okay. with John Legend, Alicia yeah. Keys. Um, They're all phenomenal musicians. But I have an idea. Uh, you it. probably know, I'm sure. There are musical artists who have done duets with their musical heroes who are no longer with us. Natalie Cole started it, but Barbara Streisand has done it. Barry Manilow's done it. Have you ever considered making an album of duets with those great legends? Because technology would allow you to do it. It's interesting because um, on my last record, I did one track uh, with a Polish artist by the name of Zbigniew Wodecki, and he had just passed away and he never ever recorded the song My Way. He he recorded a Polish uh, live version of it where he changed the lyrics were a little bit different. Um, you Such can do it. You can do it. Idea. I, I just still love the idea of like for example, even though I can't see you, I'm still we're playing we're playing catch. I'm throwing a ball to you, you're throwing it back, and it's like if, if I miss, you know, we have a little bit of give and take. When you're when you're working um, with someone, unfortunately, who's no longer here, um, that you can't really change anything. No. Um, and like I said, when I did that duet with Bigna Vodetsky, I felt like he was in the room with me, like. I'm not lying here. It was, it was like, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Um, but nothing will ever replace that moment of you and I being in a room, having a drink, singing a song, having a conversation. And 
I look forward to doing stuff with new artists that 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 can that we can do that more so. Well, and not that's a bad idea. Not that your idea is bad, but I'm just saying. You're one of the few artists to have two holiday albums, Peace on Earth from 2004 and my favorite, Old School Yule from 2016, which went gold. I love that you invited the St. Michael's Choir School to sing on the album. That must have been really special for you. Well, it's uh, it's back to my roots. I mean, most of the guys I hang out with um, in my life are all from that school. We've been friends for over 35 years, if you can think about that. And that school gave us a lot of things that there's a reason why I'm still in the music business is because of that school and to have them on my record just brought me back to my youth brought me back to um, the opportunity to sing in a choir again even though I was singing solo I still thought I was you know in the choir um, they're a phenomenal school that has a great history and it's a pretty rare school because that kind of music isn't really done at a choral level very often so it was it was a little bit of a dream come true absolutely you're also one of the very few singers who also produce your own albums and this was really evident in the jet set jazz album yeah. what is it about producing that you find important in creating that unique sound of yours control <laughs> well everyone who knows you says yeah. that you are the consummate pro you're a real perfectionist well, I mean, like, listen, I, I, I've never, ever, ever, ever gotten away from this idea that no one will care more about you than yourself. Um, why would I expect someone to do a better job than me? Maybe I don't have the skill to, but at the same time, you as an individual, others have their own life. And if I can sit there and, and nitpick and, and work um, towards doing something, Number one, I'm not, I won't be annoying to the other person because I'm only annoying to myself then, <laughs> to the producer. <laughs> uh, and second of all, it's, uh, it's called value engineering. It's a question of economics. I can make more records if I produce them myself. Well, and the more the better. I have <laughs> to tell you, um, I've seen you in concert many times. You have a very comfortable and relaxed delivery on the stage. You create this kind of Las Vegas intimate showroom vibe. Uh, now you're way too young to have been to any of those Vegas showrooms in their heyday. So how did you learn to perform like a classic crooner with all that swagger? Well, I mean, listen, um, some shows I'm probably not proud of. <laughs> but None that I've seen. Thank, thank the Lord. <laughs> um, you know, it's like as, as a kid growing up, uh, going from my, you know, mid teens to, to early to later teens, you know, there was DVDs, I could go and I could find uh, some DVDs of Frank Sinatra, I could watch um, Tony Bennett play MTV unplugged that very, very famous show, right. And, you know, I remember being in my basement and wearing a my tuxedo and pretending I'm singing. <laughs> and kind of watching what they would do and marking and, and uh, you know, every artist comes from watching somebody. So I just think I was very fortunate that those things were actually captured on video and I could watch them. That was the beginning of it. I think you really absorbed it. You didn't just watch it. I think you actually reinvented yourself. Uh, and if anybody out there has not seen Matt Dusk in concert, do not miss the chance. I promise yeah. you, you will be Thank hooked. You. <laughs> it's How? fun. I mean, it's, it's, we, we always try to get the audience involved so that at the end of the night, they feel like they actually witnessed something that was together versus just going like, oh, I went out and nah. you know what I mean? No, nobody says that, Matt. I've been in the audience. I can tell you that's not what they say at all. <laughs> I have to ask you, how have you and your family managed during the pandemic? Well, it's been interesting. That's for sure. A um, lot of questions. A lot of thinking, pondering the future. Um, my wife's self-employed, so it's been a struggle for her as well. Her business has been, uh, you know, limited to what she can do. Um, on a personal level, it's it's really weird because, it, you know, I know you can say this and your listeners will, well, is that we will always remember these years. 
Oh, and I think part of it's going to come back to what did we do in that time? What did we do? We were given an opportunity to do stuff that possibly we never could before. So as an, as an example, um, let's give you an example, New Year's Eve. I'm sure you've gone to New Year's Eve events before. And this year, um, we had a couple of people over. We were outside. We were in snow pants. We were by the fire. We celebrated New Year's Eve outside for six hours. And it's little things like that when you spend your time with your family where you'll always remember that. Now, in regards to the rest of the pandemic, I can tell you right now, musicians, artists, creators, restaurant owners, anybody in the hospitality business just wants to get back to work. Any idea when you'll get back to performing live in concert? So apparently I am going to be performing in late May, early June in Europe. Uh, sure. I don't think it's going to happen, but um, our first our first big tour starts in 2022, and it's I think the biggest tour we've ever had. So, I think I think uh, we're we're calling it like revenge touring, <laughs> <laughs> where it's like, let's go. <laughs> Matt, do you really get how good a singer you are, and how much people really love you and your voice? Do you really get that? No, of course not. I mean, we're artists. We live in our own head. We're, our, we're, I will say this though. Um, we really can walk off the stage and not need much criticism. We, we already know if we did well or if we need to improve. Comparison is challenging just because um, you can't compare one artist to another and then say one is better or one is not because they're two separate artists. It's a matter of opinion. But at the end of the day, when I walk off stage, I'm already making notes on how to improve because I just spending all that time with Tony Bennett, he just taught me that it's like, you're always improving. You're always improving. Keep going. And that's the thing. There is no end line. There is no finish line. Right. So, but you're probably your own toughest critic. You know, of course. That. you, you probably are your own toughest critic. Give me a break. <laughs> Everybody is. One of my absolute favorite songs of yours is Every Mother's Son from your mm. first major album. I hope when you go back on tour that you'll include it in your repertoire because every mother and every son loves that song, Matt. Well, uh, we're taking sponsorship slots, 10 grand a song. No, it's kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Well, Matt, I know I speak for all your fans when I say that we can't wait to see you perform live in concert again. We can't wait for more Matt Dusk albums whenever you want to release them. Have you got any recording projects in the works that you can tell oh, us about? Oh, there's always stuff on the go. I mean, I'm very fortunate that uh, the catalog I pull from is endless. It's like bottomless. It's like, you know, when you go to the, the restaurant, bottomless pots of coffee. They're, they're <laughs> there. So um, lots more music to come out. And why not? Music makes the world go round. Well, you are such a credit to the music industry and to Canada because you consistently deliver great music. You keep the great songwriters alive and you make us all so proud. I feel like a proud uncle. High five. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for Thank spending you. this time with us. We wish you every success. Come back anytime you want. You're always welcome. Sweet. Thank you for having me. It was a nice afternoon. Let's go for a walk. Let's get out in the sun. Our guest today has been music superstar Matt Dusk. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. See you next time.